about women encouraging women and it being a Wednesday we are joined by a beautiful guest on our show the strength of a woman so kindly Joanne introduce yourself thank you so much Faith so my name is Joan Wangeshi and I run a home called Fountain of Hope Center so yeah I think as you talk you'll get to know more about me mm. yeah. you, so you're Joan yes my Joan name is Joan Wangeshi, Wangeshi yes. and you run a foundation called Fountain, Fountain of, of Hope, Hope Center so where is it located Okay, so Fountain of Hope Center is at Limuru, Kabuku. Mm -hmm. um, I think our biggest landmark is St. Paul's University, the main campus. So that is where we are located. So we are just about 500 meters from the road and you get to, get, uh, you get to the center. Yeah. So apart from running the foundation, mm -hmm. who is Joan? What does Joan do? What interests Joan? Yeah. Who is yeah. Joan as a woman? Okay, so basically Joan is a very independent woman. And uh, this is because I was of course raised by a single mother. So um, Joan is also a mother, she has three children, and then she has 17 plus other children that she's been taking care of. Uh, I'd say these are my God-given children, and I love them very much. Joan is also a farmer, and also a jack of very many trades. So you farm? Yes, With all I this farm. beauty? I mean, your hands <laughs> yes. look so soft. Yeah, I call myself a posh farmer. Wait, do you farm, farm, or may you delegate the farming? Let me tell you, by the way, sometimes yeah. you'll find me in boats and inside that farm. Are you serious? Yeah, you have to be hands-on because you okay. see you need something perfect uh -huh. and you want to encourage your workers. So it's good that you join in with them and you show them, you know what, it's good to get dirty because out of that dirt something good is going to come out of mm. it. And there's a reason why I'm actually farming for my children. Wait, yeah. so the, your, your children, children, um, the ch your children plus the 17 plus <laughs> children? <laughs> They're all my children. All of them. They cut across all of them. Yeah. So, okay, wow, this is so interesting. So yeah. what do you farm? Well, um, in my farm we have potatoes, we do uh, minji, we call them peas. Uh, we also do French beans mm -hmm. for export. But basically I major on potatoes. Yeah. So when did you decide to get into farming? Ama, why did you decide to get into farming? Not like Kuza Weaves, Ama yeah. Viato, Ama Ngo. Why farming? Know, right? So um, for the farming, let me say it has always been a habit of mine, even when um, when I was a very small child, I'd take like small beans, some maize, I go plant. So I like the way I see this thing coming up, oh. you know, and, and I'm like, um, you know what, one day, one time, I'd love to have such a big farm. And because there's so many people who are hungry, mm. I'd always be the fan to watch stuff like Al Jazeera. Yeah. And still as a child, I'm watching Al Jazeera instead of our normal news. So I'd be like, I'd want to feed nations. This is where it began. Mm. Yeah. Na yo passion ya kids ya kuchukua kids from the streets mm -hmm. kwa kwa adapt. Where did that come from? Okay, so my mom has been um, let me say a professional trainer for quite a long time and uh, in her career we've had the opportunity to go towards different kind of slums in Kenya. So I remember when I was small there's one particular slum she really used to go to that is called Kuwinda slums in Karen. So we used to spend a lot of time there, especially the weekends, we just give food as a family and it used to be so nice and so fun and it was also an eye opener as to you know not everybody is equal in life we, just, we have the haves and the haves not so as the haves what can you do about it so i'd say that um when it comes to charity it began with my mother and what she exposed us to mm, yeah that's really nice so uh how did the, the children's home start? Like when you decided this is what I want to do with mm -hmm. my life, this is my purpose yeah. in life. How did it start? When did it start? How mm -hmm. many kids did you start with? Well, Faith, that's quite a story. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so my children's home basically began with, um, let me say it's my life testimony. Okay. And uh, at some point in life, all this world just came to a stop. And we became bankrupt. And we went to the lowest of the lowest. And I remember there is a um, couple of times I tried approaching family and the doors were just closed. You know, and I really wanted to finish my education, but no one was willing. At this time, I was joining campus and my brother was still in high school. Uh, of course, the bankruptcy came as a graduation. It was not just like abrupt, but it was a graduation. So we moved from private schools, public schools, and then everything just went haywire. Uh, you come to a point where I'm not going to school fees and you're like, since when did you start Kufkuzwa school fees? I'm in a public school. Mm. You know, you look at the paintings in school and you're like, um, this is how, uh, sorry to say, toilets are painted back at my former school. That's how bad it was, you know. 
But um, I thank God for everything that happened in our lives because um, despite the challenges we passed through as a family, um, I think it was more of God taking me through a journey where I needed to start something and not just go somewhere and just visit and give something and then that's it. Now as we talk, let me say I'm a solution provider. I solve problems, not just uh, managing but solving problems. So yes, you're taking food to these people, but as you take food today, are you still going to take tomorrow? Mm. What can you do different? that you can actually help them so that they can also come up and be able to help themselves. So basically that is where it all started. So for the home, um, let me say I went, I got the opportunity to go outside. My aunt sponsored me at least. And uh, so I had to stop campus, of course. And I worked for a while. So when I was there, that's when I called my mom and I'm like, you know what, mom, we need to get these children in our own home. So I told her to go rent a place. So this is where we began. We began at Ndeya, a three bedroom house. And um, the kids, the number grew so big that um, we had both uh, big boys and big girls in the same house. Got a little into trouble with the Ministry of Health, of course. So they told us we need to build a dormitory outside. And because the landlord was not accommodating, we had to move by the end of the year to somewhere bigger, which I had no idea where. Mm. But um, we walk and live by faith for that home. And let me tell you, on my knees, or rather on our knees, because I was not the only one praying, God delivered. And as we speak, we are in a very big home. Um, it's very comfortable, very convenient. It's child friendly. It's a nine bedroom house. And let me tell you, if I was to tell you how much you're paying rent there, you'd be shocked for a nine bedroom house. Yeah. Of course, it's up for sale. Let me say that because um, you're looking towards uh, buying this home. Like I said, I'm a solution provider. You see, if you and I ever run into trouble, you always have somewhere to call home. But for these children, when they run into trouble, when they don't make it in life, where do they go to? So they need a place of their own where they can actually own it. So that is Fountain of Hope Center. And how many kids did you start with? Um, initially, I started with nine street boys. Okay. Yeah. So during that time, of course, with my mom, sometimes we'd even hit the, still, the streets. We'd go to Bays, you know Bays, right? Like here, Grogon. Eh. So we go do some little cooking with them. We yes. talk with them. Yeah, we just sit there and whoever is ready, we go home. So at that particular time, we used to take them to our place. And then we educate them uh, just nearby schools around. Yeah. And in choosing the children to adopt, mm -hmm. uh, what like what's the process? Is there like a procedure? Ama, you just go, you meet a kid who needs help, you yeah. take them, you talk to them, and you take t them to, to your home. Okay. So Faith, initially, that was how it was. Uh -huh. Go to the streets. If a child is ready, they want to come home with you. Of course, they will come home with you. Yeah. But right now, um, because of uh, there's a lot of child traffic and a lot of things happening that are not so good, the government has made some measures so that homes are not... Um, make let me say minting money out of children because of course child labor child mm -hmm. trafficking yeah. all these things are there and we've even had very many homes being closed and that is what you can see right now currently the situation in the streets the street children are so many so basically what happens is that now they come through the police um, the chief and the the children's office every county has a children's office so for us they come through the children's office and then uh, sorry from the magistrate court through the children's office and then uh, she delegates them to us. Mm. So our children's office uh, officer is Madam Mary. Okay. Yeah. So we are under her currently. Yeah. Really yeah nice. So we are also legally registered as a CCI in Limuru. Yeah. So I'm really curious. Uh, you know, these kids uh, have been through a lot in their lives. Yeah. You know, sleeping out in the cold, yeah. not having food. Mm -hmm. So there's a way that their mind functions. Uh, they're not so receptive and welcoming to strangers mm -hmm. so after you adapt this kids, is there a form of education you offer to them to like change the way they think to something else and most of them are using gum or mm -hmm. other other drugs yeah so after adapting the kids like what what else what else happens in the children's home amani a place too for them to feel secure is there mm -hmm. any education that happens okay so at Fountain of Hope Center, we have the five full phases. Okay. We shelter, feed, educate, rehabilitate, and then we reintegrate. So basically, you can say we're a, a bridging gap between the community and us as the center. Okay? Because you see, in as much as this child is, uh, he is at this home, they don't belong to you. Even if they're calling you mom or shusho or uncle, they don't belong to you. They belong to someone. And um, especially for the younger ones, when they get to 18, that is when it hits you and hits them. Who am I? Who is my family? So we really try our best to find, even if it's just one relative who is accommodative, who is ready to take up this child. We now start the healing process between that family and this child. 
Sometimes you find maybe um, it's a woman, she got married to a man, this man does not want these children. So we come in and we, let me say, put out the fire and we try to find a, like, a mutual balance where this child can get what they need mm. and also we can take this child away from the streets and clean our society. Mm. So let me say, um, put this on record, huh? for these children, they're not actually receptive or they're not hardened. What happens is that by the way, they're very friendly. Oh. They want to say hello to you, but every time they come near you, you're like, Utanibia. You know, you start mm, acting in yeah. a very funny way. Okay, some are hostile, yes, but it's because they've been there for so long, they've not had any love, they've been suffering rejection time and time and again. And I'm like, every time you look at this child, just think about this child like it could be your child. Today you might not be there, God forbid. And you know, you'd want your child to be taken up by someone and be happy, maybe your brothers or your sisters. But it doesn't happen like that. You find that most of them, they're like, um, this is an extra mouth I need to feed. No, I can't do that. Let someone else do it. This is how these kids are ending up at, at a home. And uh, worse still, maybe even in the streets. So before you even judge this child, think about it. What would actually make this child leave the home, the comfort of a home, food, a warm bed, to go and live in the streets? What is that that is lacking back at home? Yeah. That is the question. Even as you call that child Chokora, mm. it is someone's child, a woman who gave birth brought this child to this world what happened back at home so that is where the pro problem is and that is what we need to solve yeah okay and are there like rogue children like the ones that are brought in but one at kaku kurudikwa streets like mm -hmm. do you do you experience such such things oh faith we've had a lot of them uh -huh. so many of them like um i'd say one case i had for a child in from all the way from tanzania he came in a bicycle and then he's also deaf so how he was even, I think he, were, uh, he became deaf later on in life because he could communicate, uh, he could write. So I think the deafness came later on because you could understand him. So he would, you know, do like this and he's like, of course, you know, he's being chased by dogs the way as he's doing it. And he met a lot of things along the path. So when this child came to us, he was coming from Tanzania to Kenya to look for a job, to work. But he's a child. Mm -hmm. He's under 18. Yeah. I, I don't even think he was maybe even 15 or 16, 16 years old. Mm. But um, he was coming from Tanzania all the way to Kenya to look for a job. And he's not the only case. There are so many other cases, okay, of children who opt to leave home for one thing or another to find a place to work. And some of them will find a place to work, of course, but of course that is not what you call child labor, okay? Mm, yeah. And some of them just land on the st streets mm. because even we who have done um, our degrees, our mm. graduations, some of us still sitting with those degrees back at home, that work is not very easy to find. So um, these children, um, they come in, we take them up as they are. It doesn't matter where, which level you stopped in school, we take you back to school if you're willing. Okay, yeah. and um, if you wanted to go to campus, uh, sana sana we, we do college because of course campus fees are very high. Mm. And uh, so we do what we can mm -hmm. as a home. Mm -hmm. So this child is free to either stay or they, if they wish to leave, they can also leave. So we don't like lock them up. Mm. It is not a kirigiti. Uh, you know kirigiti, yes, they're actually know, locked up, know, exactly. Yeah. So this is a home whereby we want this child to know we want to love you. So if you can trust us and break that um, wall, then we're able to accommodate you and make your life better. Okay, so is there like an age bracket of the, the kids that you take? Like, do you take uh, like kuna age, like mm -hmm. from two years yeah. to 18? Mm -hmm. How about you just take any child? Okay, so for Fountain of Hope Centre, yes. we normally prefer three years and older. Yes. But um, let me say the recent I have, he's 10 months old and he was thrown and found when he was two hours. Wow. So the mother gave birth, mm. the child, the baby was, was found two hours later. So that's when you received this mm -hmm. child. So he's the youngest I've ever had in that home, but normally you take from three years. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you told me that uh, you, you re reunite the kids yeah. with the parents or yeah. the relatives. Yeah. So like, for example, that, ten, that, that small baby that you have, yeah. probably you'll never know the mother of this yeah. kid. Mm -hmm. So... Will you take care of this kid peleke shule, ama what will happen? <laughs> yeah, so faith of course when you 
when you put up yourself there as a mother, it means it's mother all through. Yes. You know, Akunanga mama half, you decide mm. today I'm not your mom. Yes. So this child officially is now a fountain of hope center and mm. he's officially my son. Okay. And our son of that okay. home. Okay. And we are very proud of him. Yeah. So yes, even if he's 18, 20 or 50, he'll always be the son of that home. And that will never change. And even as we speak currently, we're even looking towards adapting him officially. Um, so he'll bear my name. Ah. Of course, yeah. Wow, that's He's so a very nice. sweet child. Ah, that's yeah, a, that's yeah. really nice. Yeah. And what about education? Like, do you do you pay for them school fees? Mm -hmm. Mama, is there a school that has partnered with you guys mm -hmm. to offer education to these kids? Mm -hmm. How do you finance your organization? Okay. So for the school, uh, basically, like I said, we do what we can. Yes. So we just take them to the local schools around the area. Yes. And uh, let me uh, especially say it, um, I'm re really gracious to St. Paul's. St. Paul's has really helped us a lot. St. Paul's, Paul's Primary and also oh. the campus. Okay. Um, a lot of the students come in, they actually come from their school to St. Paul's Primary and they go, they pay school fees there. Are you serious? Yeah, exactly. These are students you're talking about. Not grown-ups. Not, not grown-ups. These are students. Like that home has actually stood because of these students. Wow. Yeah, I give them gratitude. Like if I'm to, if I'm to be asked, um, do you have donors? I'd say they're my number one donors. They have really been with us through thick and thin ever since we moved in to Kabuko. So these children, of course, go to the local schools. And um, for the bigger ones, we prefer them in boarding school uh, because, you know, day school also is such a hassle once in a while. But yeah, we do what we can. And whoever can come in on board and help, please feel free. Mm. So what we do is that um, we normally tell people whatever you can, whatever little, just pay direct to the school and then you help us with the sleep so that you can take to school. Yeah. So what's the, the oldest kid in your home? Well, um, the oldest I have is 20. 20 I years. think going to 21 years, uh -huh. yes. And you, see, you realize that uh, when, that, when a child has been on the streets for so long, there's so many things that they have lacked. And for them, it's a process. And you find even this child, probably he's 17, but he wants to go back to school. Maybe he stopped when he was in class six. How time one it's already too late mm. for you. If he's willing, take him to school or take her to school. So we just be begin the journey with them and we make sure that you finish with them. Some of them, they say, no, I don't want school. And they're young. And you're like, okay, so can you do a vocational training? And they're like, yeah, that is better. So we do like uh, short courses for them. Mm. Barbering, mechanics, uh, training, uh, sorry, uh, hairdressing and beauty, so such like things, especially the young mothers who feel they can't go back to school now that they've given birth. Um, maybe they have two babies and they're like, I'd rather do a course, so we take them to courses. And after the course, like, do they, in Afkanga Point, want to decide? No, right now I've been educated yeah. with, the, with the foundation. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to start my life outside. Yeah. Yeah. So do you let them go and start their life outside? Um, if they're ready, we will. Mm -hmm. Normally we will gauge. You see, this is a child that you've struggled so much to make sure that they've come back to the right way of how life should be lived, okay? This is a person who has been doing drugs and so many other things. Probably maybe they're even in prostitution. So you don't want to have a situation whereby they claim and say they're ready. Because I always say, if you're ready, you'll be, you'll be out of this home with six months rent, Kwanzaa. Yes. So that you don't go out there and then you start calling, oh, I'm stuck in rent. Yes. You know, and then when you start saying, I'm stuck, then it means you'll have to find plan B of how to get your rent. So if you're a prostitute, what does that mean? You go back to that street. So what it is that we make sure that we can totally and 100% see you're actually independent, that you're actually ready to go out. So even as... Um, for the government, after they're 18 years old, they're supposed to exit because there's an exit strategy. But even as we do the exit for them, we are always keen to make sure that they are okay. Mm. So for some, we let them go early, but for some, we sort of delay up until we can see that they're ready. So we just don't send them out there because a relapse is very easy. We don't want a relapse. Yes. If they relapse, then it's very difficult to get this person back on track. Yeah. Uh, so you told me that you farm, yeah. and through your farming you're able to feed and finance the kids. Yeah. So is there any economic gain on your side? Am I you just doing this because this is what you're called to do? Okay. Mm. So Faith, I'll answer that question, which is a very interesting question because um, a lot of my friends have had issues with that. Yeah. So basically I farm, of course, and let me tell you, farmers are the richest people, especially those in agribusiness. Yeah. They are very rich okay. people. But uh, let me say this couple of years have also not been so good because we had the political interference, then we had the funny rains, and then after that we had this difficult drought, and then we had corona. 
So this couple of years had been a bit of an issue. But farmers have good money because you see out of one acre, maybe for potatoes, you can get maybe minimum 50 bags. 50 bags you sell at uh, 3,000 bob, one bag, you have 150,000. Okay, your capital is about 80. So you see that is really good money that can actually help you do something compared to a person who is in 8 to 5 and is in, uh, he's being paid maybe uh, 50, 20,000, you know. So you actually get good money out of it. And then also if you plan your money wisely, then it's very easy for you to manage yourself and everything else that you want to do. Mm. Plus, of course, like I said, I'm a jack of many trades, so I also invest. So um, for those who say Bitcoin is really bad, see me culprits or bitcoins yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah we can say yeah yeah okay for me it has worked mm -hmm. because um well personally uh, i'd say i was in this uh, program called mmm it really worked for me mm. and i didn't have to do the referrals and everything so i always call them the hit and runs even these pyramid schemes i call them hit and runs you just gauge how long has it been there mm. okay um is it viable is it giving you good profits so you do it if you up on toroka just make sure you remove all your money. That's it. Mm. You just have to play twice. Yeah. So you say that Kumekwana challenges Kiasi because of the economy, Corona. What what other challenges have you experienced in your journey? Yeah. Mm. Well, okay. Um, let me say, uh, family, friends has been a challenge for me mm. because you see, you expect this would be the number one people behind your back, but they're not there. No, those people you expect them to hold your hand, they're not there. So I can count very few of the family that is actually, um, you know, there with us. Even if St. Paul's students are not able to come, at least there's family somewhere. They were not there that, that time, but I, I can see now things are improving. I thank God for that. Also, let me say finances. Finances have been a very good, uh, big challenge. Because you find that, um, you see, even as much as they say free education, it's not really free. We have the tuition fees, we have, uh, sometimes you have to buy the books, we have the exam fee that you have to pay for, and you see you don't have one child, you have like 17 plus children that you have to pay for tuition, maybe kilometer make sure 50, 50, 50, 50, you know. And also aside from that, uh, we also have challenges with now like the farm. Um, I have to like, it's, it's quite far because of course our uh, fathers, yeah, Mashamba yeah. has Ziko, yeah. okay? So you find that you have to lease land. Leasing is also a very expensive affair. You find uh, even leasing one acre up to 20,000. You know, some is even 50 or even 60,000. Just leasing alone, you have not planted anything yet. So challenges are very many, but you just try to overcome well, how you can. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, kuna challenges more, but mm -hmm. pia kuna the growth that you have experienced. Can of you course. can you explain to us what growth have you experienced from the time you began mm -hmm. till now? What are okay. the positive things? Wow. Um, let me say there have been a lot of positive things. Um, let me give gratitude, of course, to my bigger sons and my bigger daughters who have come back, of course, to say thank you, mom, for taking care of us. You know. And they've really stood with me, even times when I've decided, hey, you know what, I'm quitting this, I can't do this anymore. They've been there holding my hand, okay? And also, aside from that, um, as for that home, Fountain of Hope Center, everywhere I go speak, because I believe I'm doing the right thing and I'm walking as God has asked me to walk, I find favor. Sometimes I go to offices and I just talk with one person. Maybe I was even going to talk something very different. And they're like, oh, so you said you have a home? And they get more interested. The next thing you know, they have come. You know, with whatever they're coming. Like, I remember a scenario where I had taken um, a box to Naivas. It was Christmas, during the Christmas day. Mm -hmm. So you need people to put whatever they could, if it's toys or anything. You know, normally you'd not buy toys in a home. You mm -hmm. think about food first. So um, I just went to them and I put the box. And then the next thing in January, you can imagine New Year, a whole truck just came to our home. Uh, bearing all sorts of food, you know, and I was, I was so overwhelmed because I was thinking, oh my God, it's January, and you know, it's crazy before you think about food, school fees and all these things, and then there's a truck load of food. That really gave me a very big boost. Also, along this line, it has helped me meet so many people. Uh, I've gotten really good networks, also in my farming, because even to get to French beans export, it's because of someone coming home seeing these children, seeing how they are kept, mm -hmm. you know, loving how they are all smiling, speaking in English, by the way, my oh. children speak in English, okay. yeah, oh, yeah, sure. and they're like, <laughs> and they're coming from the streets, I'm like, yeah, you know, these people actually know English, oh, yeah, and nice. even if they don't know, they can actually learn, so you just, someone is moved, and they're like, what can I do for you, and I'm like, you know what, I'm a farmer, 
how can you help me along that line? So you meet your networks. Mm, yeah, okay, so I have really grown in that area. Mm -hmm. Also, as a mother, it has taught me a lot because my kids are young. Uh, the youngest is now six years. Yes. Sorry, the oldest is now six years. Yes. So um, having dealt with teenagers, of course, now I know how to, you know how to deal with, deal with kids, my of own. Course, uh, exactly, yeah. Okay. So it has given me experience also as a mother. Mm. And uh, I think my greatest growth would be spiritually. Because if there's one thing I have learned, yes, you can take this child to a rehabilitation center. Yes, you can call all the professional counselors you'll call. You'll do all that. But let me tell you, if you don't deal with the spirit, the principality that is holding this child, it's very difficult to break these things. Because breaking drug addiction is not easy. And that is why people easily relapse. Mm. So for me, even if we do, we go physical, we also deal with it spiritually. Spiritual From the aspect. day that child steps into that home, mm. we deal with it spiritually because we teach them how to pray. We teach them that, you know what, you don't need man. It is God that you need. We teach them that, yes, it's an addiction. You feel you can't, but you can because God can enable you to do it. Mm. Okay? Yeah. So, yeah, spiritually, I think I've really grown. And I've learned how to fight, you know, fight things. They say the battle is not mine, it is God. You know how to stand in, to ask God to come into your situation. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, that's so inspiring. Mm -hmm. So, what's the future like for you? What, yeah. what do you want the future to look like for your foundation yeah. and for your kids? What are you, what are you anticipating? Okay. Well, um, my goal, my future is really, really big. I mean, I have this I envision this very big home. Let me let me say I admire Thomas Bernardo's home and okay. Akina SOS village. Uh -huh. Those are the kind of homes yeah. I look up to. Uh -huh. These are people who take their kids to Jonathan Clog, you know, all these nice, nice big schools and you're like, I'd want my own to have that kind of an opportunity. These are people who have like a swimming pool there. Your children couple of Kiriman and their swimming pool, you know, like you're making calculations. So I'm hoping I can have this really big home where I can also give the mothers, the young mothers, an opportunity instead of aborting, just come and let your child be adopted by a couple who does not have children, you know. I, I want to have a home that has a college inside, a university, you know, um, a primary school and a high school. This is the vision that I have for Kenya, you know. And not just Kenya alone, even in Uganda, like have a proper home where children are kept the way they should be kept because people will always throw away children for one reason or another. Depression is real by the way, you know. And when depression hits, sometimes you find um, the mother is just... Atakama meza umtoto na mtakaji, depression is really mm. bad, you know? Mm. Or maybe the parents are not there. So where will these children go to? Can someone actually offer them something safe, something secure, you know? Can someone offer them a home where they can eat uh, in as much as I sound ambitious, but I'd want them also to eat sausage. Waski sausage in onja, je? Siku mama pale kwa hotel and they're like, mm. what are they eating? And you just, nice, you know, just uh, yeah. You'd want to give them something better. So I'd want to give them a home they can call their own. That is what you're looking mm. forward to. And I made a vow to God and I told God, God, if you give me this home, mm -hmm. I will give you thanks. But aside from that, I will not build my own home until you give me a children's home. So that is the goal, getting a home for these children. Oh, you're so selfless. Mm -hmm. So as we part, mm -hmm. uh, I want you to talk to the kids out there or the community, the society, and tell them what is in your heart and what you would want the kids to know. Yeah. Mm. So, Faith, as we part, let me say, um, children will always be there, and they always say that the children are the future of tomorrow, okay? But they're not going to be the future of tomorrow if you're not making things right right now. And by making things right is doing what you can where you are. So that single mother that you see there who is struggling, do something about it, because what you do today might protect this child's future tomorrow. And you can actually make whatever, um, let me say, steps you make towards this particular home. It can actually help this child tomorrow. Because maybe there'll be, there'll be that zeal to want to, you know, they're like, uh, Uncle Flani anakujanga anatutembelea, anatuletea food, mm. analipe kitabu. Mm. You know, even giving them, giving them that book or even that pencil, yes. it goes a long way to make sure this child thinks, you know, there's someone who still cares and I can actually study and make something good out of myself. Even for the children who are there, you know, it doesn't matter what your parent is doing back at home or what your guardian is doing. Stay strong because there is a God who actually listens. There is a God who knows that you need something that you don't have it at that particular time. It's a struggle, but they say nothing happens under the sun that has never happened before. And by the way, you're not the first one. 
there are so many who have passed through that, uh, you know, that terrain, but they have come through. So either way, you're going to come through. And if you're looking for someone to motivate you and encourage you and you can't find one, don't worry. Motivate yourself first. When you do that, then everything else will mm, come. Yeah. But remember, God above everything. God above so that everything. is what I tell them. And for the parents out there, we need to go, go back to the society where our children, it was the responsibility of the community, not just you alone. Right now, so easy, kitu kifanyika kwa mtoto, he could care less. Yes. We have so many missing children. Nobody cares. We need to start caring. We need to find our humanity. Because if we don't protect the future now, that is it. Okay. We don't even have a present. Okay. That is my part. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank John. You. Your story was so inspiring. Thank and you. I'm already inspired. I mean, we need more people like you in the world who who are selfless and who love and who are not about, you know, building themselves, but yeah. also their community. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so my much. My prayer for you is that you grow and that your foundation grows. Amen. Thank you yeah. so much. So that was Joanne. And she, I, I mean, I'm just speechless. Me at Asina Maneno Sai. Her story is so inspiring. What she does to the society is so inspiring. So that was Joanne for us. And we want to encourage you to do more to the society and help, help and love, love people. Mm -hmm. So right about now, we're going to take a break but we'll be right back.